title. We're going we're gonna to be talking today uh, about the relationship between husbands and wives. Um, but before we dig into to our text in First Peter today, um, I, I want to talk to you for a minute about the attitude that, that we need to bring into any study that is done uh, about trying to find out what the Bible says about marriage uh, and, and the relationship. Uh, because the Bible talks about these, uh, about the marriage relationship in a way that it doesn't really jive with a lot of what's out there in 21st century America. It's not really uh, what's popular. And in fact, a lot of people will, will actually reject what the Bible has to say or they'll want to twist it to suit their, uh, their politically correct uh, cultural view of the day. And, and our, our series is called Live Strange. Our series here in First Year it's called Live Strange. And unfortunately, if you were to take what we're going to talk about today and put it into practice in, in your life and your marriage, um, there, are, there are a lot of people uh, who would think that's strange. Yeah. To a lot of people, it would appear strange. So let me say, first of all, that we need to approach this text that we're going to read here in just a second. We need to approach it carefully, um, but we got to leave any sinful, selfish attitude behind if we really want to get out of it what we need to. One of the sins that most, uh, I think that most often causes hardships in marriage is the sin of pride. The sin of pride. Pride results in selfishness. It's that, it's that me, me, me attitude that's so prevalent in, in today's world. Um, but there might be some of you going, you know, you're thinking right now, well, well, I, I don't have that problem because in our marriage it's a it's a fifty fifty proposition, right? Well, if if that's the case, if you think marriage is a fifty fifty proposition, uh, guess what? That also is a selfish attitude uh, because marriage is not about trying to just equal and balance everything out. It, it's not about uh, you know, well, if you give this, then I'll give this. It's not that at all. Marriage is actually uh, giving everything you have without any reservation at all. It, it's, a, it's a 100% all in for the other person proposition. So if we talk about husbands need to love your wife as Christ of the church, or wives need to submit to your husband, the first thought should not be, yeah, but what am I going to get out of it? The second thing I want to mention is that, that we need to leave behind the attitude that uh, everything that's done today has been better than it used to be done. I think we think that sometimes. So many people today believe that we've, we've progressed to the point that we are at the peak of social development, right? Like we've just, we've developed as a, as a culture, as a people, to where the, you know, the, the things that we do and the views that we have and the norms of today are far superior to the way they used to be before. Um, and, and so, to the point that if the Bible disagrees with the cultural norm or the cultural beliefs of the day, then it's the Bible that must be wrong. Right? Isn't that just what it says? Well, as we read our passage today, I want to encourage you to just consider what God has to say to us from His Word. And see if you can put it into practice, trusting in the fact that God's way is the best way. Amen? God's way is the best way. So let's read it. Turn to 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1. And it says this, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if sons do not obey the word, they be, they be won over without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see a respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So he begins this, this, this uh, passage here 
uh, with the word likewise. Likewise. Or, or it, may, it means in the same way. In the same way. Now, if you think of in the same way, you've got to say, well, in the same way as what? What is he referring to? Well, we have to look back um, at the passage right before this, back in chapter 2, to know what he's talking about. Remember last week, starting in verse 13, we talked about the fact that we are, we are to submit to authority, to those in authority over us. Uh, and we talked uh, primarily about governmental authority, that we should be respectful and we should submit to, to government authority. Unless they're asking us to do things that are against God's word, we are to submit to government authority. The passage goes on after that to talk about us submitting to bosses, to employers, uh, uh, and that we're to submit to those authorities too, even if they're unfair. So now Peter's talking about another relationship, as he says, in the same way, in the same way, wives, be subject to your own husbands. In the same way that we all have this submissive spirit towards government and towards employers, wives, he says, should be subject to their husbands. But you know what? I think there's even another element to this. Because that previous passage concludes with a description of how Jesus himself put this principle into practice in his own life. Uh, and, and let's read that in uh, verses 21 to 25. In chapter 2. He says this, For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for the for you to follow, that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. So when Peter says, in the same way, I believe he's also talking about this. In the same way that Jesus responded to those who persecuted him, to those who crucified him. In the same way he responded to them. Now why? In the same way he's subject to his husband. Now why would Peter connect these two things? Why would he connect, you know, wives to their husbands with Jesus with the, his his, uh, his, his torment to them. Well, well, think about why Jesus responded the way he did. Why did Jesus respond the way he did to those? He was, it was because he was submissive. He was submissive to the will and the plan of God, even in the face of suffering. He trusted God's plan for him, even when it involved sacrifice on his part. So why? be subject to your husband's and when he talks about in the same way as Jesus in that way, it kind of leaves no excuses. It doesn't leave any room for excuses. Now, I want to take one moment and, and just uh, and just say this. Uh, I don't believe at all that God, or in this passage, he is saying that, uh, that you need to stay in an abusive situation. Um, I don't think he's saying that, that if the marriage vow is broken, um, that, that uh, he's saying, hey, you need to, to, uh, uh, to, to stay when, you, when your well-being is in jeopardy. Um, I don't believe that's what God wants. He's saying, hey, stay there even if, if you're in danger or, or, or if there's an abuse there. I, I, I don't think that's, that's what he's saying. But, um, but I, think we, I think a lot of women give themselves permission principle in their life for lots of other reasons. And that shouldn't be the case. Peter's not saying that a wife is the husband's slave. He's not saying that the husband has permission to abuse the wife, nor is he saying that the wife shouldn't be allowed to have any kind of personality or any, any kind of say in the, in the family or the relationship. He's simply saying that God has created an institution, he's created marriage, and, and it's described all the way back in Genesis 2, where, where it says a man and a woman should should be joined together, and the two shall become one flesh. Well, what does that look like, and how does that actually work? Well, uh, unfortunately, I, I actually think it's uh, fortunately because uh, our brains don't actually fuse together so that we, we think the same thoughts. Now, it would help in a situation like the nail in the head, kind of thing. You know, wouldn't it be nice if we did look at everything 
pray, that can help in a lot of situations. But I don't think that that's actually helping if we all thought about everything in the exact same way. And so this diversity between the way a man and a woman look at things, I think, is healthy for relationships. Uh, but, but, but the fact that, that we don't automatically just see things the, the, uh, the same way, uh, it, God then has to design a way for this thing to work. And the husband is given certain responsibilities and certain duties that the wife is not. In 1 Corinthians 11.3, Paul puts it this way. I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the, uh, of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. See, Paul, says, Paul there is just giving a chain of command. He's not saying that either partner has greater value than the other. That's not the case. Is Christ inferior to God because God is his head? No. He's not. In the same way, Paul and Peter, they're not saying a submissive wife is inferior to her husband. They just have different duties. They have different duties. So why then should a wife submit to her husband? Why should a wife submit? Now, submission means just empowering him in leadership, uh, encouraging his leadership, following his leadership. Why should a woman submit to that? Well, uh, I like we talked about last week, it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that uh, you always agree with him, uh, or even that he's always right. Uh, it's not because um, he even deserves it, necessarily. Well, let me give you a few reasons from our passage here. The first reason found in verse 1 and 2 is that you should submit because by doing so, you may uh, lead your unbelieving husband to Christ. Peter says you can win them over Sometimes without even having to say a word. Simply by your conduct. Simply by the things that you do. The way that you do them. The things that you say. By your Christ-like conduct. You can win over an unbelieving husband. The second reason in verse 3 and 4, it says you should submit because a respectful and submissive spirit is more beautiful than anything else. It's more beautiful than anything else. Every woman, I don't think this is good, not a woman, right? and I, I don't think like one, but I, I think I understand this. Every woman wants to be beautiful. Every woman wants to be beautiful. And Peter is saying to you women, don't only pursue external beauty, like fancy hairdos and flashy jewelry and expensive clothes. Instead, he's saying, make your priority the beauty that comes from inside. It comes from within the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That is what truly makes you beautiful. You see, that should be your priority. You don't think it's wrong for ladies to wear jewelry or dress nice or fix up their hair or wear makeup? No. It doesn't mean that at all. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, though, keep in mind that external beauty is fleeting. It's fleeting. Proverbs 31 Third, it says, charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, or, or it, it, it actually says fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. It's the beauty of the heart, it says in verse 4 there, is what is imperishable. It does not fade. It does not go away. It's the beauty of the heart. It's the beauty of the heart that is true beauty. Now, external beauty has its place. It's not that you should just completely neglect how to look on the outside. Uh, but, it's, but it's the beauty of the heart that should be your priority. It's the beauty of the heart that should mean more to you as a woman. That's what should mean more to you. And I'll tell you, husbands, it should mean more to you as a husband as well. But you know what? Husbands, you need to tell your wife that she's beautiful. Tell her how beautiful she is to you. She needs to hear that. She wants to hear that. Third thing is this. You should submit because it honors God. Submit because it, it honors God, first of all, because it's, it's simply obeying Scripture. It's what it says in God's Word. Uh, it, it's, it's simple obedience to God. And remember back where it says, uh, in the same way? So if, when you submit, when you have a submissive spirit, uh, you are being Christ-like. And when you live out your life in a Christ-like way, it honors God. Peter also 
also goes on in verse 5 and 6, it says, by submitting to their husbands, that's how the holy women of old used to, who, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. In other words, how they used to pursue beauty. The, the women of old, the, the holy women of old, who, who the people, the women who, you, who were noted for the people who, who put their hope in God. This is how they did That's how they adorned themselves. That's how they pursued beauty. It was a part of their holiness. It was a part of how they put their hope in God. And so a respectful and submissive person is honoring to God. What are some pretty good reasons, I think, to uh, pursue a submissive, respectful spirit? So wives, I, I hope you'll take that to heart on this subject. Dear husbands, respect his leadership. Empower him as a leader. Help him become a better leader. Follow his leadership. That doesn't mean you don't have a place, you don't have a say. Respect him. But Peter doesn't leave it there, because he has some things to say to husbands as well. So let's read verse 7 again and see what he says. He says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. It begins again with this word, likewise, or in the same way. And so for the same reasons he said to the wives what he said to them, he now, for the same reason, says what he says to the husbands. Because of what Christ did and because of the example, of the example that, he, that he shared earlier in that passage, in the same way, likewise. And here's what he has to say. Well, what does he say? He doesn't say, well, husbands, you should subdue your wives. He doesn't say you should overpower your wife. He doesn't even say that it's up to you to make sure she's submissive. What does he say? He says, first of all, you need to be understanding. You need to be understanding. Now, the word here for understanding is translated elsewhere to have knowledge. Oh, boy. You know what he's saying? Husbands, you need to have some knowledge about what your wife is going through. You need to have some knowledge about how she's feeling. Oh, that's where you get scenarios like that. <laughs> that's a kind of a funny example, but, but the reality is... Uh, and, and it's difficult sometimes, guys. Let's be honest. It's, it's difficult sometimes to figure out what our wives are feeling or, or what they're going through. But, uh, but let's be honest. Too many times we don't even try. We're not even really trying. We just want to fix it and let's move on. You know? Let's just get that behind us and let's move on. And, and, and we're not even trying to, to know what they're going through. We're not even trying to know what they're feeling. The second thing he says to us is that husbands, you need to show honor to your wives as the weaker vessel. This gets a little sticky sometimes. We start mentioning this. Is Peter really saying that, that women are weaker than men? I mean, if we're honest, then there are some ways that women are more weaker than men, generally speaking. I mean, generally speaking, uh, men are stronger physically than women, although it's not always the case. I always remember men being big and shaky and effeminate. But, uh, uh, so, that's not always true, but generally speaking, that's true. Uh, typically, you know, men are, are stronger physically than women. But if we're honest, women in a lot of situations can be way tougher than men. Let me give you an example. If men had to give birth, we would have been extremely weird to even give birth. I don't know if we could have handled it. So I don't even think that's what Peter's talking about here. I, I don't even think that's what he, in fact, I don't even think that Peter is saying that women are in fact weaker. I think what he's saying, I believe what he's saying is that, that husbands, you need to treat your wives as if she were the weaker vessel. Treat her as if she were the weaker vessel. In other words, we need to treat them as a delicate flower, as this delicate vessel. We need to treat, give them the royal treatment. We need to be so protective of them. 
as if we wanted nothing to harm them or hurt them or, 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 or damage them. We, we need to show them honor as if they were the most special thing in our lives. Protect and take care of and handle gently so that, so that nothing would ever injure or hurt her or damage her or cause any harm to her. Keep her that way. The third thing he says is that husbands should value their wives. Husbands should value their wives. It says there that, that they are co heirs with us in the grace of God and the grace of life. Co heirs. As co heirs, this means they have equal value. It's not that men are above them and then they get the leftovers of the, of the you know, of the, of the blessings of God. They're co heirs, they have equal value. Don't let their submissive attitude cause you to think of yourself as above them or, or greater than them or more valuable than them. But it's just not true. They have a different role, but they're not less valuable. Treat them. Husbands need to know. You want to know how important this is to God? He says right here, if you fail to treat your wives in this way, he says it's going to hinder your prayers. You know what that says to me? That says to me that, that if you're going to treat your wife poorly, God's going to quit listening to you. That's what that says to me. You want to treat your wife poorly? God's going to say, you know what? That's my daughter that I'm going to treat that way. I don't know if I have anything else to say to you, so you straighten out if I can treat my daughter. You can't have a healthy relationship with God if you're going to treat your wife poorly. You can't think you have it all together with God if you're treating your wife like trash. Because it's going to affect your relationship with God. actually thinking though about the situation that, that Peter was writing to though. He's writing to these people who who uh, uh, I would think would have had to be going through an incredible amount of stress. Now when we think about it, I've seen it a hundred times. Uh, you inject stress into a marriage and boy, it becomes really difficult. Every hardship that, that, that exists in that marriage just is magnified. Whether that be financial stress or, you know, there's stress at work or, you know, health issues. You, you inject any kind of stress, you know, with the kids or with your parents or whatever stress is going on around you. you when that begins to infiltrate into a marriage relationship, boy, it, 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 it makes it really difficult. Because all the problems just get built and they become bad and, 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 it, and, and stress can take its toll. That these couples might have been going through that Peter is writing to. They're, they're facing persecution. Some of their people around them are being killed for their faith. They're, they're being tortured. They're being abandoned by their families. They're losing their jobs, all because of their faith in Jesus Christ. I can't imagine the amount of stress. How do you keep your marriage strong in the face of opposition? How do you keep your marriage strong when, when, when you're faced with stressful situations in life? Very simply, you follow God's plan. Follow God's plan. And God's plan is that wives should show respect to their husbands, and the husbands need to honor and love their wives. Wow, that's really oversimplifying it. Well, in a way it is, 
but it really is that simple. That's how you keep the marriage going. You keep the partner saying, you can be reminded when it goes wrong. How many of you find hard that God's given you for an expiration date? It's a recipe for success. Let's pray together. Father, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that you give us direction, instruction. And Lord, what you prepared to say today is not talking about a 30 minute meditation. We think we've progressed. And Lord, many times we look at what's in your word and Lord, I pray today we can look at these three things. The idea of a wife that's been your husband. The idea of a husband loving and cherishing his wife. And I pray you help each of us figure out how to put that into practice in our life. How to apply that in our marriage. And Lord, we need your help Some here today, maybe knowing that they're not going to get it, but they need to. But I pray, God, that they would give us the tool to do that. And because that's what you called us to. I pray for each marriage here, God. I pray for those who, who are doing great. I pray, God, that they would not let their guard down, but they would continue to focus on these things that you instruct us with in your word. Pray, God, for those whose marriages are they're growing tired, they're growing cold. Partners are growing, growing apart. And I pray, God, right now that they would understand how important it is for you to go all in. To make the investment, to work through what's going on. They would know if they put your principles into practice, their, their, their relationship would thrive and be healthier. I pray for those whose marriages are their jeopardy. And I pray, God, that you work miracles to bring them back together. And Lord, today I also want to pray for those here today who are not married because of the divorce or lack of issues that came to the wounds that are left open. Or there's others who are married for other reasons. Maybe they've never been married or maybe they're widows. Lord, I, I pray that you just bring your word alive to them. Show them how to put these principles at work in their life and in other relationships. Help them walk away knowing that they need to figure out how to live their lives 